Well, good evening, everybody, and it's uh, fantastic to be here in this amazing setting. And my subject is the crisis of free speech and democracy. And the first thing to say is that free speech and democracy were born together. And they were born together here in ancient Greece. They were not just twins, not even Siamese twins. They were actually in the same body. The one was unthinkable without the other. The citizens assembled on the Pnyx in ancient Athens. The herald said, who will address the assembly? Any citizen could speak. All the relevant facts were laid out. All the relevant arguments were made to the assembled people. And thus it was that the ancient Athenians decided to fight the invading Persians at sea and not on land, and thus it was that they saved the world's first democracy. A story well, well known to, to most of you, but, but nonetheless worth recalling because it is an extraordinary moment in human history. Now, subject to correction by Professor Mavrogodatos, who is speaking just after me and in a way should have speak before me, um, let me just say just a few quick things about my understanding of that original ideal type of democracy and free speech together. And the first thing to say, Paresia and Isegoria. Isegoria equals speech, of course, not yet women. The Me Too movement wasn't really there in ancient Athens, I think. Not slaves, not metics, but nonetheless an extraordinary innovation of equal right to speech. Paresia was, of course, not panresia. It was not saying whatever comes into your head. It was not unlimited free speech. It was, roughly speaking, well-intentioned free speech for the public good. Demosthenes talked about the truth spoken in all freedom. And Euripides rebukes, I quote, hectoring and untutored paresia. So Euripides is rebuking Donald Trump. Uh, 2,500 years, years in advance. The other very simple point to make about the original democracy and its free speech is that the citizens of that democracy were standing on the same ground. And when I say on the same ground, I mean not just physically in the same place, which is obvious at the Pnyx, but also intellectually on the same ground. That is to say, there is an epistemology of democracy. There is a working assumption that a fact is a fact and a fig is a fig, as I believe the ancient Greek proverb has it, uh, and that we have arguments which have a logical basis. It was also the place of Aristotle, that there is something like the wisdom of the crowd, uh, there were people in Silicon Valley who thought they'd invented the wisdom of the crowd in about 1998. Of course, it's all there in Aristotle in what is technically known as a summation argument. So the common ground was not just physically that you were in the same place. It was intellectual. It was epistemological. There we have before us a sort of ideal type of the free speech that you need for democracy. Now, travel with me 2,500 years forward in time to today, and it's obvious that a country of 10 million people, let alone 350 million people, cannot all assemble in the same place. So our deliberative democracy has to be mediated, and for that we have what we call media. That's what media are for, to mediate. Arguably, there weren't any media in ancient Athens. It is actually true, however, that one or two of the rhetoricians, for example, Isocrates, who complained that he had a weak voice and so actually couldn't reach people from the bema, from the platform, so he had his speeches copied by slaves and then circulated uh, in his rivalry with Plato, who also had his text circulated. So there was a kind of proto-media, even in ancient Athens, but not media in the modern sense. But today, we have not just media, we have the internet, 
and we have what all of you have in your pocket or bag, the smartphone. And the question is, what is that doing to the nexus of free speech and democracy? Um, we are experiencing, many would argue, some kind of a crisis of democracy that has many elements. Uh, it has to do with the poverty and inequality as a result of radical neoliberal economics. It has to do with the rise of authoritarian capitalist countries like China. It has to do with people not bothering to turn out to vote, with the sense that the political class is unrepresentative. There are many, many reasons. But one element of it is what is happening to our media, to the media we need for democracy. So what are the media we need for democracy? In my book, Free Speech, Ten Principles for a Connected World, available on all good Amazons, I spell out three qualities that I believe the media we need for democracy should have. Uncensored, diverse, and trustworthy. Uncensored, diverse, and trustworthy. And let me take those three. They're carefully chosen. Now, 20 years ago, in the sort of heroic optimism of Silicon Valley in the 1990s, cyber libertarian optimism, the idea was that the internet would set you free. It would of itself defeat censorship. And Bill Clinton famously said, for China to try to control the internet would be like trying to nail jello to the wall. And you know what? The Chinese Communist Party turned around and said, Bill, just watch us. And I would argue that the Chinese Communist Party has made a pretty good stab at nailing jello to the wall over the last 20 years. They have proved that a determined authoritarian state can reestablish territorial sovereignty over the internet and impose censorship. Just recently, when the Chinese Communist Party announced the proposal that um, the term limits on the president would be abolished and Xi Jinping can therefore be the chairman of everything forever, um, many terms were censored on Chinese social media, including, amazingly, the term, I disagree. That was censored. You can't say, I disagree. It's almost what the philosophers would call an ostensive definition of a dictatorship. A dictatorship is a society where the term, I disagree, is censored. And surveillance. So what we didn't foresee 20 years ago is that the internet would become a formidable machinery of surveillance. An American internet specialist called Bruce Schneier says, surveillance is the business model of the internet. That's how it works, by collecting unbelievable quantities of data on you and me and then selling them to advertisers. Now, so what Facebook and Google and Twitter know about you is beyond a Stasi general's wildest dream. Now, if you put that into the hands of a determined authoritarian state, you have a formidable apparatus of surveillance. So uncensored in the age of the Internet is still very problematic. Not a big problem in democracies, but what about diverse and trustworthy? So first of all, diverse. So what we have on the Internet, the media landscape on the Internet, is a curious combination of unprecedented concentration and unprecedented fragmentation. So on the one hand, you have a few platforms, Google, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Twitter, which have an amazing concentration of information power. Remember, Facebook is not just Facebook. It's also WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger and Instagram. So all these platforms in one set of hands on the other hand, you have an absolutely unprecedented fragmentation because you have an almost unlimited possibility of self-publishing, right? So almost anyone can be a journalist and be a publisher. Now, the argument would be that this fragmentation, because each of us can have our own newspaper 
or our own broadcaster, produces what we call echo chamber effects, filter bubbles, where those who support Donald Trump are only hearing the views of those who support Donald Trump and those who support Hillary Clinton only supporting those of Hillary Clinton. Now, actually, the research does not entirely bear this out. Um, what it looks like, and we don't fully know, but what it looks like is that for people who want to know more, actually this new structure of information and communication gives you incredible possibilities to access a, a range of views and news that you couldn't possibly have accessed even 20 years ago, even 10 years ago. So people, if I may say so, like us, I assume everybody in this room being in a room full of enlightened people, um, we actually have a wider range of views. But those who are already to some extent polarized, who are inclined to the extremes, they do go off into their echo chambers of the like-minded. And the more extreme they are, say, a, a, an Islamist or an anti-Islam extremist, the stronger the echo chamber effects are. So that the Norwegian mass murder, murderer Anders Bering Breivik, we know, was radicalized, and his radicalization was reinforced by a strong echo chamber effect of re visiting a handful of, of extremist websites. And the problem is that once you get on that path, the algorithms of the platforms will reinforce the echo chamber effect because they privilege engagement and response. Um, so that there's this complex effect, actually a plus for many of us in the middle, but a big minus at the extremes. Then there is something distinct but equally important, which is that the development of the Internet has basically destroyed the existing business model of most newspapers. Right? Um, so, I see a few journalists in the room nodding here. Most newspapers, with a few exceptions, are struggling for survival. And what do you do when you're drowning? You wave and you shout. And so our newspapers are waving and shouting. That's to say they're becoming sensationalists, they're going down market, they have more celebrity news, more partisan news, because that's how you get the clicks. And that's how you try to survive. And the effect of this is that something we had almost by accident for about 200 years, which was that the public good of news was supplied by private means through the accident that a newspaper had a business model which was people paying to buy it and advertisers paying it. And that business model has been blown out of the water, so the business model of the newspaper is in crisis. At the same time, we have something which is not new, but which is quite marked in our time, which is controlled by ownership. Right? So what looks like media pluralism, because you have a whole variety of owners of different media, turns out on closer examination not to be. A classic example of this is Viktor Orban's Hungary. If you look on paper, Viktor Orban's Hungary looks as if it has perfect media pluralism, very diverse ownership. They just happened all to be cronies of Viktor Orban. Right? And if they're not cronies of his, they are companies that depend on contracts being given by the Hungarian state in other fields. The same is to a significant degree to, true of Recep Tayyip Erdogan's Turkey. It's not censorship so much, although since the coup it has been, it's controlled by ownership. If you put those two, those multiple things together, then I would summarize my argument as follows. The classic American image for the free speech we need for democracy is the marketplace of ideas. And it's, it's a particularly American version of the Agora, because it's not the Agora or the Penix in a general sense. It's specifically the marketplace as in a capitalist market. 
And what I think I want to argue to you is because of these changed circuits, what we're facing here is what I would call a market failure in the marketplace of ideas. The market is actually not delivering the public good that it used to deliver. And then there's trustworthy, my third quality. Please note, I don't say objective, and I don't say impartial. I don't believe that objectivity is attainable to mortal human beings and to most journalists. But trustworthy, that's to say there is a relationship of trust between the journalist, the publication, and the reader or the viewer or the user. And, and the contract of trust can be very different. I mean, George Orwell was not impartial. He was explicitly partisan. He said so in Homage to Catalonia, his great book. But there was a contract of trust with the reader. I'm going to tell you what I saw and how I felt and thought about it. Uh, John Snow on The Daily Show, I don't know how many of you watched The Daily Show, absolutely brilliant news show, um, had pieces of complete invention on it, satirical invention. But there was a relationship, a contract of trust with the reader. Okay. Now, the problem is that this trustworthiness, which was never perfect, there has never been a golden age, but which did exist, has to a significant degree been undermined by some specific developments which are loosely captured by the phrase fake news, post-truth, post-fact. Now, we're going to talk about that tomorrow morning, so I'm not going to go into depth in this, but let me just single out a couple of elements in this. One is there are now very good studies which show that false information is as likely to go viral online, particularly on social media, as accurate information. It's about 50-50. And the reason for that is the one I mentioned before, that the algorithms of the platform privilege engagement. The more clicks you get, the higher you come up. The higher you come up, the more clips you get. And because fake news, whether it's made in a Macedonian meme farm simply to make money, or whether it's made in a Russian internet agency for political purposes, the former I call misinformation, the latter disinformation, one for commercial purposes, the other for political. Whether it's misinformation or disinformation, it's designed to be sexy and attractive. Um, uh, the Pope supports Donald Trump was a classic example, a real example, which went viral during the American invention. The other point is that in the world of social media, there is, if I take, if I, if I, if, let's take the analogy of food. Think of information as food. There is absolutely no food labeling. You don't know what you're eating. So we at Oxford in the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism actually did a study in a number of countries asking people whether they could identify the source of a number of news stories and opinion pieces that they'd seen on Facebook and Google. They couldn't. They had no idea whether it came from the Wall Street Journal or from a Macedonian meme farm. Um, we, there was another study done at Stanford which came to the same, uh, to the same uh, conclusion. So that those are at least two reasons why the contract of trust, which was one of the basic foundations of the media we need for democracy, has to a significant degree, I think, been undermined. I don't want to overstate this, because I think it's often overstated uh, in popular discussion, but there is certainly a problem. Um, one other, just quickly, one other effect is that and this comes back to the epistemology of democracy. The epistemology of democracy depends on a certain evidence base. It depends on people accepting certain facts and certain arguments. The rhetoric of populism, a la Donald Trump or Recep Tayyip Erdogan or Nigel Farage or Alternative für Deutschland, 
builds on emotion more than on reason. A little example. Some of you will remember that when Donald Trump claimed that Barack Obama was not born in the United States, you remember that? And whereupon Barack Obama published his birth certificate. Now, for you and me, that might be fairly conclusive evidence that he was born in the United States. What did Donald Trump say in an interview? He said, many people feel that it wasn't a proper certificate. It's not even many people think. It's many people feel. It's just an emotion. So I may think this jacket is blue, but you feel that it's pink. And the emotion triumphs over the reason. If you look at what populism does in the echo chambers of the internet, it's not so much from case to case about specific untruth. It's about an emotionally appealing nationalist narrative, simple nationalist narrative, which trumps, the verb has acquired a new meaning, which trumps the countervailing evidence. I want to leave a little time in the spirit of the PNICs for a few questions from the floor, if, if that's allowed. Um, but let me just say quickly, address the question of what's to be done about it. And do not despair. There is a great deal that can be done about it. First of all, we need to know more about what's actually going on, which requires the platforms like Facebook and Google to share more data with us, because they're the only people who really know what's going on. If you have public service broadcasting, like the BBC, hang on to it for dear life and double its funding. Because public service broadcasting has a mandate to do what the media are meant to do for democracy. Um, aggregation and curation sites do a very good job of countervailing the polarization and echo chamber effects because they bring together diverse pieces of content. Increasingly, we're seeing foundations funding serious investigative journalism and foreign reporting. Why not? There's absolutely no reason why the business model of news should be the model of the newspaper of circa 1900. And I think foundations have an important place to play. A great deal will depend on the platforms. I spend a lot of time talking to the platforms. More transparency, telling us more about the algorithms, for example, in Facebook news feed, telling their users what is actually a political advertisement paid for by the Trump campaign or somebody in Moscow, and what is a genuine news piece, um, giving us more context. And last but not least, the craft of journalism. In my view, this is a great and actually exciting challenge for the craft of journalism. We need a new George Orwell to go out there and find how you can tell really good evidence-based stories in a way that reaches into the echo chamber of populism. Those are just a few thoughts on what we can do. As I say, I would wel welcome questions and comments from, from the floor. But it says somewhere in the Talmud, if you don't know where you want to go, any road is good. So we have to know where we want to go. And where we want to go is to this never quite attainable ideal, which is one in which we have uncensored diverse and trustworthy media so that informed citizens, having heard all the arguments and all the facts, can make informed decisions. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, we want to go from the PNICs to the PNICs. Thank you very much. Yes, gentlemen here. into the formulation, the information flow... There's, there's a microphone, for, I think, in case people can hear the back. Yeah. Sorry, for the, for the translation. Sorry, I start again. Klaus Wittmann, Aspen Institute, Germany. You said there's a need to know more. 
And I think there's a problem which a speaker at uh, our command and staff college in Hamburg once coached into the formulation, the information flood leads to a knowledge desert. Can you comment on that? Yes, yes. I mean, there is, of course, the um, D-I-K-W pyramid, which is a pyramid which has data at the bottom, a mass of data, information somewhat less, one level of uh, working through. Then you have knowledge. And at the top, the tiny peak of the pyramid is wisdom, D-I-K-W. So that is undoubtedly true. And um, uh, uh, for the contemporary historian, it's interesting because for the ancient historian, the problem is the paucity of evidence. For the contemporary historian, the problem is the precise opposite, the superabundance of evidence and can you find the nugget of gold in this vast sea of information. But I do actually think that a combination of sort of journalistic, academic, and technical uh, approaches are beginning to address that problem. Uh, first of all, for all my criticism of the algorithms, do you remember how bad Google was 15 years ago? It was absolutely terrible, and then there came a moment, and now it is, with all its faults, absolutely amazing at coming up at the suggestions you might want. And then I think, as I said, the model of curation and aggregation sites is a very, very powerful way. So it's a problem, but I think there are ways to address it. Yes. Lady here. Is there a microphone? Okay, Nancy Green, I'm a historian from the Ecole des Études in Paris, and I'm, t I'm extremely taken with your argument. I'm worried, however, about even the question of trust, because I think one of the problems is that people on the extremes are trusting what they believe or what they seem to be hearing. Maybe it's emotional, as you pointed out, rather than based on rational or even on wisdom or the education that they might have maybe had or <laughs> is maybe not sufficient. But the question of trust, I think, is something that is at all, on all sides of the spectrum. And we all, I think, read what we're interested in reading. So occasionally I look at Fox News to see what the other side, in a way, is saying. It's subtler than one thinks. And so instead of just seeing the, looking at the news that I normally would have looked at. So I think that we're all, in a way, reading, and I think this was true for newspapers as well. We took, you know, subscriptions to the newspapers that we were, that we thought were, for us, the most trustworthy. How do we deal with the fact that people have different levels of trust and different levels of information, basically? It's a great question. My words in the book are chosen with great care, and the word is trustworthy. So it's not just trusted, it's worthy of trust. And that's how I address the point you make. Um, I think that polarization of the media, although, as you say, it's as old as the hills. If you read George Eliot's Middlemarch, one of the main characters in it goes off to edit a newspaper. I think it's called The Trumpet. And at one point in the book, he says, there are two kinds of people in Middlemarch, those who read The Trumpet and those who read the other paper. <laughs> So that's, that's always been true. But in recent times, we have also had a significant part of our media which aspired to some kind of what the BBC called due impartiality. And I mean, the New York Times would be a good example of that, trying to keep its news coverage pure while having its opinion. And I worry about what is happening into the United States, which is that that middle, which is striving for some sort of genuine fairness and balance, is shrinking and shrinking. I mean, basically, MSNBC is Fox News Arabo. It's the same from the left, but it's just as partisan, I would say. And, and the middle ground is shrinking. And now the New York Times, which, of course, has come out as a campaigning paper against Donald Trump, and I can well understand why, but, but, but once, you've, once the gray lady has climbed down from Mount Olympus, it's quite difficult for her to get back up there. So that I do think that the, just the, the fact of polarization, the total polarization of a media, is a big problem. 
Maybe time for one more before the next speaker. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm a journalist. Nora Rally is my name. I live what you described before. Um, there is a law that is uh, voted uh, uh, almost one month ago in the U.S., in USA, uh, I don't remember now the name, but it, it uh, has to do with the internet. Uh, it's a very cruel form of uh, censorship and control because every new or site or uh, 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 point of view that is more uh, le to the left or more revolutionary or even ecological <laughs> is uh, sensitive, yes, uh, is going to be buried really buried in the deep of the internet and no, it will be very, very difficult to find it. I will remember the name, but because we made a big deal of, out of it in uh, my newspaper. Now, my question is that, how do you comment on that? This is a fact, we can look it up. And the second thing is, now, what is the responsibility of the, of the citizen if such law are in uh, value? So, well, I'm not sure that I know exactly which law you're referring to, but it may well be the provision on net neutrality, the net neutrality. And this is, and it connects to the last question, so that um, when the Internet developed originally, it had this underlying principle of net neutrality, which is you could not pay to get your content delivered faster down the line. All packets of information were to be treated equally. And after a titanic struggle with country, companies like Comcast, which of course wanted to monetize that advantage, the Obama administration, under the Obama administration, the FCC made a ruling which basically defended net neutrality. And that was very, very important indeed. Now what you're referring to is under the Trump administration, that position being reversed. And that is very, very worrying indeed because the larger principal picture is that we, we have a, a kind of global competition, a global power struggle over what will be the rules of the game for the internet. And the three biggest players are China, Europe, and the United States. China with a very, very strong notion of information sovereignty and state control. Europe with a, a somewhat complex model in which, you know, the state is given a much larger role, for example, in the new German network law in, in limiting hate speech content online, and the United States standing up for the First Amendment model and net neutrality. But if even the United States starts abandoning its First Amendment principle, if even the United States starts abandoning the principles of net neutrality, there's not much hope for it worldwide. Um, so it is, it is a very important case. And, and uh, you know, if charity begins at home, then so does net neutrality. Thank you very much.